good morning, guys. Uh, welcome to North Park Church live stream. Um, glad that you're joining us here. Uh, we want to just thank you guys uh, who have been faithfully tuning in so much week after week and uh, hungering for the word of God that's coming out week after week here. So again, expect to be blessed uh, this morning with the word of God, the solid teaching of God's word this morning. Um, as we begin in worship together, let us pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this time of gathering together, uh, people gathering together um, in their homes to tune in to our live stream, God. We, Lord, we ask, Father, that you would just uh, be glorified in the things that we're doing, Father, um, through the preaching of your word this morning, God. We ask that you would save lives, uh, sanctify hearts, Father, we ask, Lord. Help us now to turn our attention to you in worship and really uh, praise your name, and we ask this in Jesus' name.
Give ear to my prayer, oh God. Hide not yourself from me. For I am restless in my suffering because of my enemy. Because of my enemy. My heart in anguish, but still I play. The fear of death has fallen on me. And I wish that I could run and hide. I cannot feel you by my side. Oh, I cannot feel you by my side. But I call on you, God, morning, noon, and night. Oh, in you I will confide. But I call on you, Lord. You will redeem my soul. I am safe in you, I know. together. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much uh, for being able to come before you and worship. Um, God, help us to hear your word preached to us, Father. Um, God, help us to really tune in, and uh, thank you, Father, so much for the opportunity that we have to preach your word and for your word to be able to go out. Uh, God, we just ask, Lord, that you would be glorified, and uh, we pray this in Jesus' name.
Well, uh, hearty good morning to you. Great worship again. I pray that uh, that uh, worship was uh, powerful to you as it was to me and leading us into the presence of God and helping us to enjoy um, the, the miracle that is the fact that we can call on God morning, noon, and night. Well, uh, we are back to our Kingdom series. This is a series where we are teaching through the Gospel of Matthew. So if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, we arrived at Matthew chapter 8 a couple of weeks before the uh, uh, special time of Easter when we kind of went back to the resurrection and and talked about that. And now we're back to this Kingdom series, Matthew chapter 8. We'll look at verses 14 through 17 uh, today. And uh, uh, remember that Matthew's central focus really, of course, is, is Christ, but the kingdom of God is, is the direction that Matthew takes uh, the Christ, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Those two terms are synonymous. And uh, a couple of weeks before Easter, as I mentioned, when we came into chapter 8, we ran headlong into one account after another of uh, Jesus healing people, various kinds of afflictions, various kinds of diseases, Jesus healing people. That all began at the beginning of chapter 8. And that might really bring us uh, a a lot of questions. What we're going to end up with is about two full chapters of Jesus doing these miraculous signs and wonders with a real emphasis on healing. And uh, I, what's your position on healing? What, what do you think about the healings of Christ? What do you think about healing today? Well, I think our text today is incredibly helpful to answer some of those questions. Uh, it speaks to the details of Jesus' life, his day-to-day life, and it answers some very curious questions in regard to uh, the miracle of healing. When and where And under what circumstances did Jesus heal? What did that look like in his lifetime, and how do we look at that in ours? Um, If you go to Matthew chapter 8 now with me, Matthew chapter 8, we want to look at verses 14 through 17. So turn there with me, please. Uh, Follow along. I'll read this for you, just a couple of short verses here. Uh, it, It begins... And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Stop there with me if you would please. Uh, All three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, contain this story. Details are added or subtracted in the other gospels, and so we'll use those as well. Um, but our focus here, of course, is Matthew chapter 8, 14 to 17. Jesus is at the center of our text. He should be, always. Jesus is the center of the Gospels. Jesus is the center of Old Testament, New Testament. Wherever you read, Jesus is the center. But in our text, we are also introduced to a character that we have not seen in a while, and that is the character of Peter. Peter's an interesting guy. He shows up again in our text, and we get some details about Peter here that we've not really had in the past. And then uh, Peter uh, and his details sort of fade away in our text, you notice. Uh, in light of the healings, they sort of get the, uh, the center stage next to Jesus then. Healing is the obvious focus of the text. Jesus is healing. What are the rules, though? Um, What are the requirements? You you and I both know that the modern word of faith movement would say, you know, if you have enough faith, you receive healing. Well, is that what happened in Jesus' ministry? Is that the way he did things? Uh, What did Jesus heal and what did he not heal? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. 
what and where, uh, with a minor on the word where, did Jesus heal? And when we uh, work through those questions, it's great because what we're going to end up with is an answer to the key question, why? Why did Jesus heal? And I think that's so important for us to understand today. So uh, what and where did Jesus heal? Well, first of all, I want you to notice directly from the text, Jesus healed common illnesses. Jesus healed common illnesses. If you look there at verse 14 again, notice that it says that when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. Well, she had a simple fever and Jesus healed her. There was nothing too common, nothing too minor for Jesus to heal. He healed minor illnesses. Now let's talk about the character of Peter for a moment because uh, he sort of gets a a moment of limelight here, doesn't he? Uh, If if you'll notice there, uh, we haven't seen Peter since he was called as a disciple of Jesus back at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. That's when Jesus initially was uh, walking by the sea, we're told, Matthew 4, 18, and uh, Peter was with his brother there casting his nets into the Sea of Galilee, his brother Andrew with him, and Jesus called him to follow them. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You remember that famous verse at Matthew 4, 19. Uh, He called him to be a disciple. Somebody say disciple. That's important because uh, it's not until Matthew chapter 10, and I'll ask you to turn there if you would, but it's not until Matthew chapter 10 that Jesus gives these disciples authority at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. He gives them authority. Watch this now, Matthew 10 and verse 1, and he called uh, to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Look at verse 2. The names of the 12 apostles are these. Now stop there and notice that these were simply disciples of Jesus. That's what all of us are who have been born again, who follow Jesus, were disciples. But they became apostles when Jesus gave them authority to do these miraculous things these powerful signs and wonders that showed who Jesus is, that's when they became apostles. Peter then was one of the 12, chosen, designated, had authority. Uh, He's one of the only 12. We need to mention that here as well. When you come over to Revelation chapter 21, we see that the 12 apostles have their names written on the foundations of heaven. It's not as if those are scribbled out or another foundation is made there's 12 and 12 only there's 12 apostles who have the authority that Jesus gave them they're not here anymore but not only is Peter one of those 12 apostles but he's one of the three he's the inner circle you remember Peter James and John were often the inner circle who went with Jesus in special places like the garden where Jesus prayed or the transfiguration where Jesus was uh, transferred into his transfigured into his glory for a moment they witnessed those things they had the inside scoop so to speak they were with Jesus in in those uh, situations now notice a couple of interesting things about Peter if you'll look back at our text again Matthew chapter 8 notice that Peter had a house (laughs) Uh, Peter had a house I think it's a a key thing to talk about here for a moment Uh, This is where the particular miracles in our story, the healings in our text, take place. They happen at Peter's house. Peter's house was probably in Capernaum. Uh, Peter was a fisherman. He fished on the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Mark chapter 1 and and, and Luke chapter 4 are the parallels, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus preached at the synagogue in Capernaum. This is the sequence of events that take us to where we're at right now. So Jesus is in Capernaum. He, he's preaching in that synagogue. And the, remember now the story. The people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught as someone who had authority. They were amazed, and they, they couldn't even believe it was this, this, this simple man, but they, which they shouldn't have believed because it wasn't a simple man. But notice that they, they were excited about the fact that he had this authority in his teaching as he taught from Isaiah, and not as their scribes. Uh, 
And he left the synagogue after preaching to these people, and he went immediately to Peter's house. That's what those parallel texts teach us. Th- this might have been uh, where Jesus was living, was in Peter's house. That's a possibility. We, we know that uh, Jesus left Nazareth. He relocated to Capernaum, and uh, we're, we don't know where. He, he probably lived with Peter and his family. You might recall that Jesus didn't have a home of his own. Uh, he, he told people that when people were coming out of the woodwork to follow him and Jesus wanted to make sure that they understood that there was a cost to following him, what did Jesus say over it, a little further down, Matthew 8 and verse 20? He says this, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, Jesus, has no place to lay his head. There's a cost to following Jesus. He said, I have no home. Peter, however, did have a home. Another thing to notice about Peter is this, he had a wife. He had a wife. It was his mother-in-law who was ill. So I just stop for a moment and say something relatively controversial, I suppose. Uh, I challenge my Catholic friends at this point to consider the fact that your church forbids their clergy to marry, and yet the one you claim is the first pope was married. The Bible uh, gets marginalized when we pay too much attention to tradition and not to the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says about things, and the Bible says that Peter was married, that pastors can marry. Now, uh, that, that doesn't mean that there's not a cost to following Jesus. If you look uh, at Luke chapter 18, do that with me for a moment, if you would, please. Luke chapter 18, <coughs> we're considering this thought, that this truth that, that Peter had a wife. If you look over at uh, <coughs> excuse me, Luke 18 and verse 28, there. Peter says, uh, see, he's speaking to Jesus, see, we have left homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many more, uh, many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Because of this, uh, some argue that, well, Peter and the others left their wives in order to be in pastoral ministry. Well, that's not quite accurate either, um, because uh, over at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, you can jot that down and look at it later, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5, Paul wrote this, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord Jesus and Cephas. Well, Cephas, John chapter 1, verse 42, is Peter. So what do we see there? Apparently, it was Peter's practice to, at least at times, take his wife along on his ministry journeys, on his, uh, in his ministry, to do his ministry. He took his wife along, at least sometimes. So what did Jesus mean when he said that Peter and the others had left wives to follow him? Well, it simply and plainly means that they left them at home to go do ministry. Same as Billy Graham left Ruth to occasionally go do a a crusade, and then he came back home to his wife and kids in his home. God would never tell anyone to permanently leave a spouse and follow him. That would not be following him at all. Listen carefully to that. That would not be following him at all. God hates divorce. God hate, divorce simply means separation. God hates divorce. We're called to lead our families. We're called to be God's men in faithfulness. We, we lead our families by showing that faithfulness, not by leaving and damaging them and going to do something else. That would never be God's plan. But the Holy Spirit, you notice in our text, Matthew chapter 8, Uh, takes great care to include the fact that Peter had a wife and Peter had a home, amen? And uh, so we see in the text, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left and she rose and began to serve him. Now I love that. A fever is about the most common illness you can find. It comes with just about anything, doesn't it? 
Jesus could have let it go. He could have passed her by, and she probably, most likely, would have recovered in a natural way. He made our bodies to do that, and, and he didn't really even have to heal her. It wasn't a necessity for her survival, but the point is this. Jesus went home, saw Peter's mother-in-law lying there sick, and Matthew, notice this, Matthew doesn't even include a request. N nobody says, would you please? Jesus just does it immediately without hesitation. He touches her hand. There's no antibiotics. There's no chicken soup. There's no cure. He just stopped. He changed his plans. He touched her hand, and she was healed. By the way, isn't it important, too, to notice that she was not only uh, healed of the fever, but she's healed of any ill effects that come with a fever. You, you and I both know that uh, a fever leaves you, leaves you a little bit weak afterward, even when the fever breaks, doesn't it? But that's not what happened here. She was completely, fully healed immediately. That word healed in the Greek means restored to health. There's nothing left undone. So she rose immediately and did what? Began to serve him. Serve him. <laughs> that means at least three things, at least three things. Number one, it means she was grateful, right? She was grateful. Don't ever forget who keeps you healthy. Don't ever forget. She was grateful. Secondly, it means that she kept her focus on Christ. I love that. I just love that dearly because... Watch this now. She didn't uh, get healed and then immediately begin to talk about the fact that, oh, she'd been so sick and people need to feel sorry for me. And She didn't do that, did she? She kept the focus on Christ. Look at what he did. I'm going to serve him. And by the way, that's the third thing that I see there that, uh, that happened. It means that she understood the purpose of her healing. Do you understand the purpose of yours? Do you understand that when Jesus Christ saves you that uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 tell us that we've been saved by grace through faith? And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. And listen to this. Listen to what it says right afterward. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When Christ puts his hand on you, when, when he shows you who he is, when you're born again, the purpose of that is to serve him. The purpose is to serve him. She knew that, and she got up and she began to serve Jesus. So Jesus healed common illnesses, but I want you to also notice that Jesus healed complex illness. Jesus healed complex illness. If you look there again at Matthew chapter 8, Notice the text again, Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> and look there at uh, verse 16. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word. So at evening, when uh, Sabbath would have been legally considered over, done, you know, you can't carry a sick person somewhere on the Sabbath. That would be working. And so people began to bring them then in the evening. Mark says, uh, listen to this, the whole city was at the door of Peter's house. They're waiting for Jesus. They want to see Jesus. They, they brought sick people. And Luke says that all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. Luke 4.40 Matthew uh, mentions that most of them, if not a, a good portion of them, were, uh, had a particular complex kind of illness, didn't they? Many who were oppressed by demons. Oppression speaks of that which affects the mind. The mind. There's no illness more complex than mental illness. This uh, evil, unseen spirit world was introduced to us back at Matthew chapter 4. You might remember when Jesus was personally tempted by a personal devil in the wilderness. And here we see the devil's minions instead. We see his demons. 
And we see that people are oppressed by them. Well, what exactly are demons? We want to remember that the Bible interprets the Bible. We don't get to say what demons are. The Bible tells us what demons are, and it teaches that demons were originally angels created by God as messengers of God. That's what the word angelos, angel, means, is messenger. Uh, but they were also created as ministering spirits to saved human beings. That's what Hebrews 1.14 says. And so part of the messenger job is to, to help Christians, help those who are true believers, those who are born again. But these particular angels that are known as demons rebelled against God in ages past sometime, and it had to be sometime before Genesis chapter 3 that this took place because Satan led in the rebellion in which he attempted to make himself equal to God. He attempted to, to steal God's authority and climb into the throne of God himself and sit on that seat. But Satan, instead, lost the battle, which probably wasn't much of a battle, and uh, one-third of the angels who followed him were cast down to earth with Satan, thus becoming fallen angels, or what we know as demons, led by Satan, who is the devil. These are haters of God, and haters, the enemies of God's people. They come to only, the Bible says, only to deceive, only to steal, only to kill, only to destroy. Their ultimate goal is possession. You should know that. That's not just a few or a handful of people, but their ultimate goal is possession, whereby an individual is entirely under the control of Satan and his minions. And back at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16, the phrase oppressed by demons in the ESV is all one word in the original language and it signifies to be possessed of a demon, to act under the control of a demon. Those who were afflicted in this way expressed the mind, the consciousness of a demon or demons who were indwelling them. And by the way, more than one demon can possess a person. We see that over at Mark chapter 5 and verse 9 where Jesus asks a demon what his name is and the answer that he gets is legion because I am many. There's many demons in this person who's possessed. So in demon possession, the person loses their mind, they lose their personality, they lose their self-control, they lose their psyche to demonic control demonic control now there are extremes and there are lesser extremes at least in a society where we accept some things and not others what I mean by that is uh, let me show you some expressions of demon oppression possession first of all we see in in the text of scripture hearing voices we see inhuman strength in some who are possessed. We see cutting, yes, really, cutting as an expression of demon possession, oppression. We see convulsions. We see the desire to harm yourself, even kill yourself, and possibly hurt others. And there are, as I said, in society, other ways of expression that we wouldn't see as so dramatic but they're just as opposed to God as any other. For example, a spirit of power and approval. We would see that as kind of acceptable in our society, and yet the Bible shows that as a possession issue. These, uh, again, I want to mention these lesser um, expressions of demonic possession are just as opposed to God as the more extreme appearing expressions well how does this happen <laughs> how does this happen well let me give you a few thoughts uh, about some things that make a person an easy target uh, the first thing probably won't surprise you that scripture speaks of making yourself an easy target for demon possession and that is drug or alcohol use now both of those things have one thing in common 
The reason that it's hard to self separate alcohol abuse from drug use is that it, it messes with the psyche. It, it causes us to be someone other than who we are. Y you might remember that anything that, and, and mark this in your, in your notes, that anything that alters my state of mind, anything that removes me from conscious thought, anything that takes me away from my ability to focus and concentrate is going to be um, opportunistic for demon possession. You remember uh, the old name for a liquor store? It's a spirit store. Uh, see, back before we got so smart that we knew so much, there was uh, an understanding that to get liquored up meant that you were under the influence of another spirit. We even called it that. It's a spirit store. Wines and spirits, you see the sign. Well, there are other things that uh, leave us open as an easy target. Another thing is habitual sexual sin. Uh, the poster girl for that is Mary Magdalene in Scripture. She was uh, apparently a, a prostitute, and Jesus drove seven demons, which means she was fully possessed. He drove seven demons from her. Uh, habitual sexual sin opens us up for uh, demon oppression possession. Thirdly, uh, dabbling in the occult. There's no surprise there, is there? Dabbling in the occult, mystics, mediums, psychics, necromancers, fooling around with calling on the dead, those kinds of things. And by the way, I need to include in here what the Bible does teach is the truth here about this uh, false teaching that is disguised as Christian is every bit as much a cult as fooling with a Ouija board. Um, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and the Bible says so do his servants. And so we dabble in the occult when we dabble in false teaching, when we misuse the Bible, when we fail to interpret it correctly, and we teach that. Well, certainly uh, there are some strings that I need to mention that are slight th th that are attached to this uh, easy targetism uh, one of them is that uh, being in a home where these are practiced can influence um, someone to demonic forces um, you might say for example you know I've never done any of those things why do I struggle so much with this in my life why is this such a problem well, sin is passed from one generation to the next. That's what the Bible teaches. It's a curse of the generations. And you need to understand, uh, I think we need to understand, it took me years to understand this because uh, the scripture speaks so clearly on it and yet it's so hard to get a hold of. You may have a greater susceptibility to certain brands of sin because your parents had that uh, sin in their life. And so we struggle with some things sometimes, and we say, where did that come from? And, well, it was passed down, just like any hereditary thing is, so is sin. When Jesus came into the world, we notice right away, don't we, that uh, uh, activity in the unseen world really heats up. Satan always prowls around like a, a, a lion looking for someone to devour, Peter tells us in 1 Peter. Uh, but when Christ came into the world, the devil knew that his time was short, and he really cranked it up. It was at an all-time high. In our text, we see God wisely ordered that. Uh, Satan and God are not on the same level. No way, no how. Satan is a created being. God is far and above over Satan, and so God allows Satan to do some things for his glory, and, and that's what happened in, in Jesus' ministry. Christ shows his power and authority over Satan and sin through control of demons. Notice here that uh, the, this is so key now. Get a hold of this. Demon possession cannot happen to a saved, born-again person. Saved and born-again is the same thing, but I always want to clarify that because so many people say they're saved 
Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. There's a couple reasons that demon possession cannot happen to a saved person. First of all, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Nobody is saved unless the Holy Spirit indwells them, causes them to be able to see who Christ is, opens their eyes, so to speak. And what happens then is you've got a clean spirit in you rather than an unclean spirit. That's what the Bible calls demons. So you cannot be possessed by uh, a demon when the Holy Spirit is in you. You might be pushed around and oppressed and fooled with a little bit, but you can't be possessed. But there's another reason and I love this, you need to hang on to this. The second reason is because of the implanted word of God. The implanted word of God. See, as the word of God grows in us, see, once we're saved, the Holy Spirit's there. That, that doesn't change. But what does change is this, we grow. And, and when we grow, we grow because of the word of God. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. That's how we grow, we grow. We're sanctified. That's what that means. We, we progressively grow. And as it, it comes in as a seed, the Bible teaches us, Matthew 13, and it grows and it fills us. And, and as it fills us, there's no more room for demonic possession oppression. The word grows in us. Therefore, you need to understand, don't you, that, that it may take some time to reverse the effects of demonic oppression or possession as we grow in Christ. But we certainly do need the word, don't we? Amen? We need the word. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 in our text, that evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word. So, Jesus healed common illness. Jesus healed complex illness. Thirdly, I want you to notice that uh, Jesus healed every illness. Jesus healed every illness. This is a, a bit startling, but look there at verse 16, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits, watch this though, with a word, and healed, what? All who were sick. Matthew says Jesus healed all who were sick. All, that Greek word for all there, just a simple little word, just like it is in English with three letters, means every kind or variety. Every kind or variety. Now in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter four and verse 40, he says this, now when the sun was setting, all those who had uh, any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. So Matthew says all. Luke says every one of them. I say this is startling to consider. In this little phrase, we see that it's absolutely very likely that Jesus healed hundreds of people every day of his three-year ministry. <laughs> no one was passed over. Wow! <laughs> the pace of Jesus' life. That's why, by the way, the gospel of John ends with these words. John chapter 21 and verse 25. Now there were also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books to be written Jesus healed them all I have an old movie burned into my head from when I was a kid um, sometimes you need to be in the word a long time before you get the bad theology of movies out of your head but uh, this, this movie's in there, and it's a, from the book of Acts. When right after Jesus was um, ascended into heaven after the resurrection, and uh, <coughs> it shows a, in this movie very vividly a little boy who does not have the use of his legs, um, and it's strongly inferred that in his lifetime, Jesus saw him and chose not to physically heal him, but only to heal him physically. 
In other words, they're depicting Jesus as, as healing some and not others. And I think that was the movie's way or the producer's way or whoever it was. It was their way of explaining that, that today some are healed and some are not. But in Jesus' lifetime, this never happened. This never happened. Jesus healed them all. What did he heal? He healed the most common illness. He healed the most complex illness. He healed every illness. Jesus healed all. Now why did he do that? Why is it so important that we understand that? Matthew chapter 8 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 7. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. That's a, from the Septuagint version of Isaiah 53 and verse 4. Uh, Isaiah 53, you'll probably remember, you should read that sometime soon. Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy, probably the clearest description of who the Christ would be when he comes from the Old Testament. When we're talking 750 years before Jesus, Isaiah says, you'll know the Christ when he shows up by the fact that he will take all your diseases and bear all your, all your illnesses and all your diseases. Now that was God's incredible plan. Consider that. That was God's incredible plan. Consider how vividly healing points to Christ. The, the healings anticipate the cross. Think carefully with me. Somebody say, I'll think. The healings anticipate the cross in that they begin to roll back the effects of sins. The cross begins to roll back. The healings begin to roll back the effect of sin. The Bible gives the whole story. Back in Genesis, our Bible begins, God creates the perfect man and the perfect creation, but chapter three, sin enters, and uh, the effects of sin, the curse, corruption, disease begin immediately. The cross rolls back the effects of sin. Peter explains this. Look at uh, 1 Peter. Turn over to 1 Peter with me, if you would, please. Toward the back of your Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now Peter's going to use the same quote from Isaiah. And he's going to use it in a little bit different way that's pretty helpful here. Look there at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's the cross. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. Sound familiar? For watch this now, verse 25, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We can't say, we cannot say that all our sicknesses are due to personal sin. But we can say that sickness was not a part of the original creation and that it certainly has no place in the final state of affairs. So at the cross, what takes place? What, what, is, what is healing pointing to? Well, at the cross, what takes place is that uh, sin is paid for. And so when you repent of your sin and come to saving faith in Christ, you're justified. What that means is you're saved immediately from the penalty of sin, which is death. And from that point on, you're sanctified. That means you're saved progressively from the power that sin has over you. You'll be more and more like Christ and less and less like the devil. And what that means is that ultimately in heaven you'll be glorified. You'll be saved ultimately from the presence of sin. And so Jesus came and Jesus showed this wonderful plan. Jesus healed common illness. Jesus healed complex illness. Jesus healed every illness. Common, complex, physical, mental, Jesus healed all. 
Now, there are three action points that I'd like to just share with you as we finish up. Three things that you can do in your life that I really would like you to consider. Number one, adopt an orthodox, scripture-driven understanding of healing. Let me say that one more time. Consider this as an action point. In your life, adopt an orthodox, that means right worship, an orthodox, scripture-driven understanding of healing. What have you believed about healing? Why have you believed it? Have you really studied the word of God on it? Adopt an orthodox, scripture-driven understanding of healing. Jesus healed as an authenticating sign that he is the Christ. He is the source of life. He is the source of salvation. He healed so that people would know that and come to him for salvation. And then, as we looked, as we studied, we understood that he gave that authority to 12 men, 12 apostles, to do exactly the same thing, to authenticate their authority in the word of God until the word of God would be complete. Now the authority is in the word of God, the Bible. Consider adopting a scripture-centered understanding of healing. Turn over to John chapter 10 for just a moment, would you please, as we finish up. John chapter 10. Look at why, what Jesus said about the healings that he performed. John chapter 10, please look at verse 37. Jesus explains. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. Well, nobody could deny that he was doing the works of his Father. Watch this. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. What's the purpose of healing and all of his signs? All of his signs were authenticating signs to show that he was the Christ, the Son of God. Secondly, second action point. Consider his healing renown. Consider his healing renown. He's famous for his healing, is he not? He's famous for his healing. It's not difficult to see the genius of God in the fact that Jesus is famous for coming into the world and healing. Jesus healed every illness so that we would hear of his renown and the power that he had, that he possessed, and then we would do what? Come to him. So we'd come to him in our weakest moments, in our illness, in our fear, even our fear of death, that we would come to him. That's the purpose of his healing renown. How many of us came to Jesus initially because we were sick, physically, mentally, The, the text of, 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 our, of our, our text today says they brought them to him because they knew. They knew of his authority. How many are coming to him now because of COVID-19? How many have been awakened if for a brief moment uh, the opportunity to be saved simply because of the fear of death, fear of loss, why are we coming? Because we heard of his renown, his healing. He can save. Thirdly, third action point, simply this. Repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. First John chapter 3, verse 8. 
Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Watch. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy sin. That happened at the cross. But it only happens at the cross for those who will repent and believe. So Jesus came and he healed because sickness is the result of sin. It's, it's the result of the fall of man. It's the result of, of our world falling apart due to sin. It's part of it. And his ultimate defeat of sin was at the cross. Salvation is, listen to me, salvation, that is repenting and trusting in Christ, is ultimate healing and it and it is it is ultimate healing in so many ways in order to be saved you must come to Christ it's ultimate healing because ultimately we'll be with Christ and we'll be out of the presence of sin but do you know that right now in this very moment when you repent and you trust in Christ, when, when you are born again, what happens is your life begins to change. Your affections begin to change. Your heart begins to change. And what happens then is, you know what? Uh, I would love to be healed physically. That would be great. But you know what? It's not near as important anymore to me. It's not near as important as the fact that God has changed my heart and my mind, that I'm full, that I'm happy, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do something more with my life than only care about myself. <laughs> there is just nothing better than being saved. Oh, I look forward to the day of being with Jesus when I'm whole and my body is whole and everything's good and it doesn't hurt anymore, but mostly because I get to be with Jesus face to face. Look, what is this but an opportunity to come to Christ and be saved? I pray that this teaching time today just as it was in Matthew chapter 8, is a time when you are brought to Jesus because that is the place, the only place where salvation happens. Will you pray with me? Father, uh, I'm grateful, God, that you are a saving God, that you are mighty to save Father, I ask that you would save many today, that, that, that you would use what has been taught here, that you would use your word, that you would use the worship far beyond any, um, any human means, that you would use it, God, to go out and by your spirit cause people to, to repent of sin, to turn, that means to turn from sin and to look to Jesus. Oh, I pray, God, that you would save many, please. Lord, it's a, we confess, it's a fearful time. But you give peace. When you save, you give peace in the worst of times, in the hardest of times, in the, in the, in the worst of loss. You give peace. Father, we, we continue to pray, Lord, that you would cause uh, many to turn from sin and to turn to Christ. And then I pray, God, for their comfort. I pray that they would find in you, in you, the peace and comfort that only you can give, the Prince of Peace. Not peace like the world gives, but your peace. The peace of Christ. Let it rule in their hearts, Father. Let it rule in their minds. Father, I know that there may be those who are struggling with desperate thoughts 
angry thoughts, frustrated thoughts, um, perhaps there are those who are, are listening, who are dealing with some of the things that we talked about, expressions that are so difficult on the inside. Father, through salvation, through repentance of sin and turning to Christ, you even give peace of mind. We ask that they would find it in you. We ask that they would find it in you, that they would take these beginning steps to trust in you. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Thank you for Jesus, the founder and the finisher of our faith. All glory be to him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I am so glad you joined us today. I pray that... uh, The worship and the word was was powerful and effective in your hearts and minds today. Thank you for being with us. Um, uh, I'm imagining that you're with us, and it's it's great to have you. Um, Thankful to be able to continue to bring this. Really grateful to these guys that have have put this together so that it works so well. Um, And uh, just want to continue to pray that uh, we are growing in a way that uh, God means us to through this tough time. Um, You know, don't you, just like I know that God is sovereign and things don't happen for no reason. And uh, so we really pray that God is accomplishing what he wants. I want to remind you that uh, we have a couple of hardworking pastors who are putting content out for uh, life group and and so you know e- maybe you're not normally even in a life group but look you can tune into that life group um, you can even do that at, at the convenience of your own time when you have quiet time alone and uh, you can study the word of God that we looked at today a little bit deeper and that'll be uh, online tomorrow uh, look for 180 uh, the the normally Thursday night seven o'clock um, uh, recovery ministry. Remember, we're all slaves to sin, and so recovery is for all of us. Um, we need to have our lives recovered. Uh, God needs to do that in our life. We don't really have control. And so uh, look for that content. That's also put out uh, early in the week. I believe it's Tuesday. Is that right? Tuesday. And uh, so watch for that content um, and uh, good stuff. And, and the notes are available for all of that also on our Facebook page, so watch for those things. Um, and these days, that's kind of the only announcements we have. So, been good to be with you today, and uh, I pray we'll see you soon. <laughs>